Yes, welcome to the No State Project. I'm your host, Mark Stevens, author of Government Indicted. The website, of course, is markstevens.net. Glad to be with you here. Uh, live for uh, episode 49 of the No State Project, uh, live on here on my YouTube stream. And I want to thank everybody. I did finally hit 10,000 subs. Now, I know for some channels that's, that's nothing. They probably lose that a month. But uh, for a channel like this, that's pretty pretty cool, pretty significant. So I appreciate everyone subbing and, and uh, getting us to that milestone. I think it took six months to, to, to go from 9,000 to 10. So uh, hopefully uh, that uh, doesn't, you know, it, well, each time you get 1,000, it seems to be a bit less. So that certainly does uh, uh, happen with a lot of channels. So hopefully uh, that, that will take off here real soon. But this is episode 49 of this commercial-free broadcast on the No State Project. And uh, whoever we don't get to today, because we do have an hour and it's in, it's not interrupted, uh, we do tend to get loaded up with phone calls and not get to everybody. So we already do have some callers lined up. And I beg your uh, indulgence for just a moment because uh, I missed this the last two shows, and and I and I'm sorry about that. Robert had uh, sent me, who does support the show, and I do appreciate his support and everyone else's support of the big show. Uh, so. Uh, what he's he's got some questions here. He says one thing I'd like you to discuss in your show is how to deal with civil little civil legal suits like the one against the makers of the Bushmaster rifle that was allegedly used in Sandy Hook. I have read the lawyer's complaint, and one thing that stood out was a line in which they stated that the makers quote should have known that their product could be used in such a manner and did nothing about it. Uh, you can find the lawyer's complaint online. How would you address some claims? Such claims. I understand the jurisdiction argument, but what other avenues would you suggest to defend against such claims? Uh, I remember in a past show you mentioned something about violating a known obligation. Uh, also, there are now lawsuits of the Las Vegas shooting. Again, how would you handle such lawsuits? Well, aside from the jurisdiction issue, obviously, uh, you still have the issue of standing, and I so I think what you're touching on here is the the, the known obligation is where I would focus my attention uh, regarding the you know the w whether or not the plaintiff has standing as and has presented a justiciable case or controversy uh, whether the, and, and have standing to sue. Yes, you have to show the violation of a legal right or obligation, and then the damage that uh, came was caused by that da violation of a legal right. Uh, or violation, violating a known legal obligation. And uh, here, there's, uh, you have to be able to show that they could have done something. So could the, could the uh, let's say the Bushmaster company, could they have done something to prevent what happened in Sandy Hook? It, could they have done anything, you know, reasonably expected and... I, you know, I would imagine that with some of these lawsuits, if they want to say that they should have been, uh, you know, some kind of uh, locking mechanism or something, some way to, I don't think that they can, you know, what happened in Sandy Hook was horrible, absolutely horrible, and no parent should ever have to go through something like that. Uh, but I don't think you can hold the... I don't think they can show the violation of a known legal duty. They're, what was it? You know, what could they have done to prevent it? How could they have designed the the the, the rifle in a way that to prevent that? And I don't think a, a design could have could have changed what happened. Um, I, you know, you can short of gun control and actually there, which is not something that can be done by the gun company, gun manufacturing company. I don't think there was anything that could be done to stop that. So I'm not saying I'm pro-gun. I'm just saying that it's a it's a it's a pretty horrible. You know, it's a pretty big violation to to just confiscate and not allow people to have guns. Uh, but if you look in Australia, they don't have any mass shootings. Uh, the United States has a mass shooting every day. Uh, they have school shootings several times or, you know, m a few of them every single month. I mean, if you live in the United States and you watch the news, you're kind of desensitized to the whole thing. So I think he's, you're right, Robert. You, you look at the standing issue, which, of course, is part of jurisdiction, depending on where you are. Uh, did they file a valid cause of action against you? And do they have any evidence to support that? So they would have to be, there would have to be something in there beyond should have known Uh you know, people who make hammers and, and make hammers for, you know, manufacture them know that people are going to be bludgeoned to death with their 
with their product. They know that. But can you do anything to stop that? I mean, short of not allowing anyone to have a hammer, which is not, which is not an issue here. It's, it, it doesn't enter into it. So uh, do you know that someone's going to be bludgeoned to death with a hammer? Yeah. Do you know that knives are going to be used to slit someone's throat, the innocent's throat? Yes. What can the knife manufacturer then do knowing in advance that their, that their product is going to be used to kill innocent people? What can they do to prevent that? And the answer is I, I don't think there's anything they can do. Uh, stop making the product, but there still doesn't. It, there's nothing you can do short of not making the product, and I don't think that that is enough. I don't think that that's grounds to uh, hold them responsible for what happened in Sandy Hook. Uh, it's absolutely terrible. Hey, government, it's a government school, right? So the idea is supposed to be that the government has a duty to protect the people. So even if you don't look at it as an individual, you look at groups, a school, it's government property. There's a special relationship there. So if there was anybody who is to who is should be legally on the hook for the damage that happens at some place like Sandy Hook, which is a government facility, it's the state government for failing to protect. So they know these things can happen. They are charged with actually stopping it. That 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 they're, 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 they're one function one legitimate function is to protect you and your children especially on their property and they didn't so bushmaster uh i don't see that they have any responsibility there because there there was nothing they could have done even with with knowledge they know this could be done but it's too far removed from who did it but the people who call themselves government they have one legitimate function that they have a prison system and they steal from us on a regular basis under the guise of taxation because they're supposed to be the ones to protect you. Remember? Allegiance in return for duty of protection. So if, if they have, you know, so, so that's where I think they... So anyway, to answer the question, Robert, and which is a good one, uh, I, don't, I would look at it from a standpoint, where is the evidence to show that they could have done something? Because it's not just they should have known. Of course they should have. Yeah, of course a gun's going to be used to murder people. But what can you do to stop it? You know, and so there's, there's nothing. It's just like a knife. Like I have a pen. You can use a pen to jab it in someone's throat and kill them. It's been portrayed in movies. One of my favorites, gross point blank. Pen to the jugular, Right? So the pen companies, I think I'm belaboring the point now, and, and so, uh, but do appreciate the uh, the the question, Robert. So, and I, and I am sorry that it took so long to get to that. Uh, I don't want that to discourage anybody from sending me questions. All right, so let's get to the phones here. We have a Skype caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Mike, and I'm calling from Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada. Mike from Alberta. <laughs> What can I do for you today? Well, I sure wish I knew about you a while ago. I can tell you that. Um, I moved to this town um, about a year ago, and there is a very great abuse of power when it comes to the police and their traffic enforcement. I have 13 speeding full radar tickets uh, come in various stages of court process right now all the way from appeals to not even pleading yet and um i guess i'm just calling to see that clarification about like jurisdiction um i i was listening to what uh jermaine was going through and i'm afraid i'm pretty sure i'm going to go through the same thing and i kind of like, like I've already pled not guilty on on some of them. Uh, what, uh, like, is it too late to claim uh, the question of jurisdiction here? A jurisdic- no, no, a jurisdiction, jurisdiction can be raised, raised at any, any time, time, even on appeal for the first time. So, uh, I know that a lot of people make they make the claim that if you enter a plea of guilty or not guilty, rather, then you're conceding to jurisdiction, or that if you're appearing, you're. Um, no, I, I don't believe that that's true, and we've had tickets thrown out after people before you know the motion's been granted or the prosecution is withdrawn because they don't want to prosecute, they don't have any evidence of jurisdiction, 
And we've had that done after people enter a plea of not guilty. And we've had that done when the judge does it uh, over your objection. So, uh, no. Uh, so I would definitely file the motion. You know, I, I've been listening to your to your, a couple of your uh, previous uh, 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 call-in shows, but uh, I, I'm trying to gain more and more information. But uh, I, I guess, like you know, we have in Canada it's called a uh, uh, d- d- disclosure request. But uh, um, um, R versus Stinchcomb is what it's based under. And would I like is that whether is my starting point? I uh, would be requesting disclosure as well as. Um, evidence of jurisdiction of both like body and 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 matter is that is that what it is? Well, you definitely yes. You're asking for in disclosure, and and it's not called Brady in Canada, but you're still entitled to exculpatory evidence, whether it's Canada, uh, anywhere the the common law system from the from the uh, from England. Yeah. So you have the same. The, it's called the stitch. It, it's called the Stinchcomb re- regime here. You're gonna have so to. You have you're gonna have to email me that. Before. You're gonna have to email me that because I can't even begin to to dispel that thing properly. So definitely, email me at Mark Stevens, <laughs> sure. Mark Stevens at mail dot com or Frank Rizzo three is the uh, the Skype. So you can do, I didn't even give that out. We had a full boat of calls, so I didn't give out the uh, the caller number before. But yeah, Mark Stevens at mail dot com. Email me that because I'd like to have that in the graphics for the uh, video that we that, that I get up there. Uh, so yes, sure. the, the exculpatory evidence for those who aren't aware is any evidence that shows that you're innocent and impeachment ma- in material or information that goes to show that the witnesses against you. Uh, are not competent or credible. I'm, I'm not trying to be devil's advocate here, but I'm, I'm going to find I'm, I'm going to find a lot of resistance to this to this uh, a line of um, of defense, I guess, uh, because I, I I just know like dealing with these with the prosecutor and the and the um, the judge who seem to be very cozy with each other that um, like they're going to like kind of like what uh, Jermaine went through that the judge is probably going to say something to the effect of yeah you who have we do have legal jurisdiction here. We don't have to prove it. That kind of thing. Well, um, if they say something like that, that, yeah, you, you need to be able to respond appropriately. Now, again, I know we have Jermaine's a good example where he did some time, but he did have most of the charges thrown out. Uh, they may, Yeah, they may actually say something like that. And that's why we have to object and bring out just how unfair that is by asking them, do I get to make, uh, do I get to make such uh, legal uh, claims against the prosecution without evidence? So yes, and you're going to get uh, resistance. There, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting, but is the, isn't there anything in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that says that uh, we um, that, that covers this that about jurisdiction about you know uh, simply because I am um, physically here that they uh, they the, the the charter falls under. Uh, over me as an um, uh, I am bound by it. Is, is there anything that that says that in the in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? As far as I know, there's nothing in there that says that. However, they, it doesn't stop them from using that because their position is always going to be that if you're physically in Canada, that their constitution or charter and rules and laws will apply to you. It's just a matter of being able to get them to hold the prosecution to their burden and not actually do like what you mentioned, which is, you know, which they do. Not necessarily that they come out and say that they don't have to prove it. That that may be more common as we go along, but it, it hasn't been a very common admission that they make it, 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 because it opens them up for some, you know, for these questions that show just how unfair it is. And then you're able to use that hopefully against them. And, and, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that we don't get to see, we don't hear more where, like they say, which remain or, or some of these other ones we've talked about recently, where they actually openly say the prosecution doesn't have to prove that. I mean, I, I'd like to be able to. I'm going to peruse your website and, and use your uh, resources to find uh, rebuttals or refutations to whatever their whatever their arguments are going to be. Um, but like I, like I said once again, um, as a as a guy who's quickly uh, the the learning curve is steep and learning it as fast as I can, the judicial system, like I have, um, I have, uh, I, I'm more than determined to fight all these like ridiculous speeding tickets it's it's something that i just don't agree with it's just a very heavy-handed tactics here and yeah. I, I i would well what i would suggest oh, though no, what i would suggest doing is get into the chat get into my no stay project skype chat 
and you can contact me at Frank Rizzo three. Get in there and start doing that. I do have the application available as well, crossed over for Canada and the script that uh, you should be using sure. in the, the No State Project Skype chat. I'll do yep. my best to get in there more often, guys, but it's uh, not the not the easiest thing for me to do. So. <laughs> And keep in mind that the basics of what we're doing here is we're not making assertions. We, it's one thing to do it here on the show, but when you're in the lion's den, when you're challenging the claims being made against you, which is all you should be doing, is challenging the claims made against you, not coming up with any of your own. So we're just going to stick to asking questions. We're going to attack the claims made against us. We're not going to give any sacred cows to the prosecution. All right, No free passes. And we're going to focus our attention yep. on the single most important claim that the prosecution's making. And, of course, that is because you're in Canada, our rules apply. Uh, the only thing I would okay. say, getting back to your question regarding the charter, would be, and only using this to point out their contradictions, is that the charter, I believe, has in there that, uh, you know, a fair trial and, you know, some, you know, you know yes. due process and things like that. Uh, due process, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's you know, I would just bring that out. And the only reason why I mentioned due process is just to show that they're not consistent with their own rules, not because I'm saying that, hey, I'm entitled to due process, because I'm not. I have no legal right to due process any more than, than anyone else does. It's just a, it, It's just in place to make it look like their system is fair. So I use that to bring out the contradictions that what they're doing is grossly unfair, that the best thing to do would be just throw it out because I'm going to be a whole lot of trouble. I'm going to make a big stink, and I'm going to challenge you every step of the way. And I know you guys don't like that stuff, so. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Like like, you, like, like I said, I'm going through various uh, stages of the, the judicial process with all of these tickets. Um, I, like like I said, even once an appeal, gone to the appeal process where I actually have to appear in a, you know, in a week or so to um, – um, to argue uh, the, the appellant and uh, the appellant's position uh, uh, of my claim of uh, uh, misrepresentation of the traffic uh, commissioner or mis uh, like errors in law. Sorry, but I've I think I've I've got a pretty decent uh, standing for for my uh, for my um, appeal. But like I'm playing their game basically. Uh, but I think I might have a chance here. So I just, should I just keep pursuing that, or do I introduce the whole jurisdiction argument uh, as well? Which I I, I would raise. In my, uh, yeah, I would I would raise the jurisdiction issue as well because again, like I said, jurisdiction can be raised at any time, even on on uh, appeal for the first time. So yes, I would definitely do that. So I want to I want to see if we can bring somebody else into this because he was on the show uh, recently and he is in Alberta. So we're going to see if we can get him on to join us. Do we have Adam? Also, I, I can I, I can I can file a motion at any time, or does it have to be a certain procedure? Well, it, in front of the court and it, the judge. Or... Well, if you're on appeal, then you're going to have to raise this as something that's newly discovered, so that it can be considered, and that jurisdiction, of course, can be challenged at any time. It was something that should have been brought up earlier. But I think, do we have Adam on with uh, with Mike? Yeah, you do. Hey, hey. Mark. Hey, Adam. All right. So, what did you had some uh, some information you wanted to relate to Mike? Because you you've yeah, gone Mike, through a similar. Hey, Mike, I'm I'm in Alberta as well, I, and I uh, have a relatively uh, fair bit of experience uh, dealing with the court system. So, what Mark's talking about, as long as you're gonna if you're gonna bring your jurisdictional argument in, just make sure you direct it at the crown, not having jurisdiction to bring the charge on you, rather than sure. saying it to the court. If you say it to the court, they'll just go ballistic, and it'll be a, a downhill <laughs> spiral. <laughs> real fair fast. enough. Yeah, it's um, because, because and, uh, Mike, the, the, we're always putting it in terms of has the prosecution, which the prosecution is bringing it in the name of the Crown, has the prosecution met their prima facie burden on jurisdiction, or has the prosecution presented the evidence? Uh, so he's right. If you, if you get, and I've had to say on the show, I don't know how many times where people come in and they say to the judge, you don't have jurisdiction. That's always a losing yeah. way to do it. And plus, you're They'll making find a statement. Out really quickly. They'll show you they have jurisdiction by asserting their authority over you. Whether even it's though they don't have rightful evidence evidence. They'll, they'll do it, right? Yeah, they don't give a fuck. No, even evidence if they don't have evidence. Yeah. Right, even if they don't okay. have evidence, which, of course, when they typically say, and we've said this, you know, we always, we, hey, we, of course we got new, always new uh, listeners to the show every week. When they, when they snap at you, Mike, 
I assure you this court has jurisdiction. We always object and ask, is that because you said so or because the prosecution's evidence does? So we want to know the basis yes. of the determination. It's, and, and so that's why I mentioned before, we're challenging the prosecution's claims against us. We're not giving the prosecution a free pass, and we're going to focus on the prosecution's main claim. And that, that's why the judge, it's always- judge, the judge has The judge has jurisdiction, but they, uh, when you ask the prosecution's evidence, that it doesn't have jurisdiction because they don't have proof of jurisdiction, correct? You're right. The judge has to base his determination of jurisdiction over you off of the evidence presented to him by the prosecution in their complaint. And if they and don't, he may, and he may or may not have it, right, Mark? It's fair to say he may or may not have evidence to show that. Well, I I tend to say that it, yes, there's there's no way in the world that the judge could have any evidence from the prosecutor. But I want to be rational and scientific about it and hold out that it's possible. But to date, <laughs> no one, including a, uh, a federal magistrate and a Supreme Court chief justice, uh, none of them have been able to present any evidence whatsoever. Because Mike, since you're new, you have to present evidence yeah. that would negate the actual facts, being that they are just men and women, and they force perfect strangers to give the money. Those are facts. They're irrefutable. So whatever evidence the prosecution would present would have to overcome that. And to date, no one has been able to do that. That's why a sitting Supreme Court Justice, Scott Bales, and I have this on video, he told me the evidence proving the Constitution applied to me, because I was physically in Arizona, was because he had prosecuted and put other people in prison. So <laughs> that's that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, and, and, so, and so you 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 may get something similar, but they tend I not think, to say yeah. so much in court because this was out I of think, court. I think we should draw a little more distinction, Mark, because um, what you said about how they justify that the Constitution applies, um, and in terms of the legal structure in the states versus Canada. So the, the charter, it, it, to ask the question, does the charter apply to me? Um, if you're talking about yourself as a, just a private individual, it never applies to you. Uh, what, what, how they describe it is that they enshrined uh, rights and freedoms, which are fundamental to men and women. We recognize them. We wanted to protect them. They're enshrined and they're meant to limit what actions government can take. But that's not that entirely true. Statement. That's part of the story. Now, somebody, and I wanted to mention this, and I didn't bring it out in great detail in, in the video, that somebody was saying that the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and here in the U.S., only acknowledged inalienable rights. And I posted text right from that, you know, legal document. And it's mm. not what the caller said. That's not what it said. It declared everyone to be citizens of the United States, except for Indians, not tags. Had nothing to, so he got it completely wrong. But here, uh, the basis of their power to tax, isn't it the, from the charter? It's from the 18, no, it's from 1867 Constitution, not from the 1982 charter. They're two different documents. Confederation, yeah. Yeah, so so there's a charter that forms the executive power and defines its scope of what they can make rules about, which is what they refer to when they're saying we have this power. And then the charter was a um, a result of you know the fundamental human rights movement that came after World War II in the 70s. The executive government signed some international conventions on fundamental human rights, and then as a result, they incorporated the provisions of those conventions into the charter to provide the individual with a defense against the state from incurring on like coming in and um, encroaching on their fundamental human rights. But it also did other things. It's a, what they call a quasi, uh, a quasi, um, it, I can't remember the exact term they're using. It's uh, evading me, but it, it not only does it protect or enshrine these fundamental rights, it also grants rights and defines certain power of the government. So it's, it, the document is doing a number of things. Okay, but we're not going in and, and necessarily saying that there's no evidence the charter applies. We're saying that the Constitution well, the and applies. the laws don't apply. Right, right. And that's fair. Okay. So I, I would say even refine it further to the specific statute that they're trying to enforce on you. I don't, right, I, I don't think it's necessary to do now. that because they're saying that their jurisdiction, regardless of you being charged with a particular statute, their jurisdiction is that anybody who's physical in Canada, their laws apply. So I think it's better yes. to just attack that instead of getting into – because now what you do is 
this is just from my experience. What you're doing is you're opening the door to a discussion on what the statute applies to because of the text. Well, look, the statute applies to anybody who operates a motor vehicle on the streets. And uh, it, I would rather well, not do that. I would rather stick to their constitution. That's like it's why I stick to the constitution. Because so, but when you say that, when when you say that about the evidence of the laws, Mark, because they they that general statement would imply that you don't think we could charge you with murder here in Canada. So you come up here and you commit some criminal action, which is written into the code, mm -hmm. and then you try and make that argument there. It's like you saying that the, it, it, it switches over to that position where now the court doesn't have jurisdiction to deal with you. They, they've, it's mixed into one thing, which is why I suggest being specific um, might just get you less flack from the judge. Well, you see, the I'm thing saying? is with that, I, under, I get that, but the <clears throat> only time I have ever had that come up was with someone, was with that one-eyed attorney. Uh, the super lawyer. Mm. He's the only one. And he wrote an article. And, and, and in fact, it wasn't even in dialogue. It was because he won't speak to me. Um, he, in text, was saying that my, because he calls it uh, reductio ad absurdum, which is, this is what he was getting at. Because he's saying that given what you're saying, if it was true, even though your logic is right on point, because your conclusion means, just like what you said, that yeah. somebody, they would not have jurisdiction to charge you with murder. And that's true. Just It doesn't mean that somebody should not be held accountable for murder. I'm just saying that the system isn't valid anymore just because someone, you know, goes and, and okay. kills someone in Canada. And I've never had to have that argument. I've never had to. Uh, it's never come up. Mm. And be, besides, it's completely, and that's the thing, when you're talking about court, Things have to be relevant. So whether you think my conclusion is ultimately wrong for murder has no application what we're talking about in a traffic case. Relevance is what's key, king in... Right, but, they, uh, in, but, in, they, but Mark, they just view it. So we're, um, I agree with you, okay? I, I agree with you. And I, I think maybe what, we're, what I wanted to offer was just how do we get as little resistance from these guys in robes as possible? Because, you know, Mike had alluded to the fact he believes already, he thinks... From his or from the interactions he's already had, like he's going to face all this resistance. He is, and, and I'm suggesting sure you it. make it. Yeah, and yeah. so I'm just saying, if you make it really clear to the guy that you're not trying to subvert the entire system and say that like I can do whatever the fuck I want. Whoa, because, whoa, but, hello but, now. But I, I get that that's I'm I'm making a jump there, but that's how he's no the language. What you're saying. Try <laughs> don't don't <laughs> use. Don't use such language, okay? But oh, I'm not a, I, I understand. I, I, I get. I get. I get that. However, based on my experience, okay, that's not something we've encountered. I know that we get more resistance from, them or it makes it more difficult for somebody when they have to talk about the when they actually have to talk about the specifics about the statute. But the statute says this. Yes, but isn't the so? And and yeah, I can get around that, but it 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 it, it takes time. And, and not mm -hmm. everybody is is as well versed and has done the role playing and is is as good as at bringing people back on point. That's why I mention the phrase first base so often, because you start out with the Constitution, and then they want to discuss the statute as if the statute is evidence that the Constitution applies, and want to discuss just the statute because that seems to fit. Look, you were driving. If you're driving, the law applies. So I bring it. I have to bring so it back. So the, the reason, and the reason that they would do that here, anyways, Mark, is because they could be referencing the statute, and that particular statute could be representative of a common law offense like murder, right? They, without drawing the distinction, it's too general, and then they view it as an affront to the concepts and ideas of justice and a court, and and how we can um, mitigate or manage human behavior. But and so that's why they get so upset. I, I think what they're saying. getting upset, really, what they're really getting upset at is the fact that, and taking their psychological makeup and the nature of the job, trying to put all this in the context and use this context. I believe that they are getting upset when they do, not because you're saying something that's an affront to their system. You're questioning them, period. Because mm. if we look at what happened with, with Bo, and, 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 and Bo is supposed to be getting out tonight, so that's great. What happened with Bo, he wasn't asking something that was an affront to their system. All Bo was do oh, what, the, what triggered it for Bo was to ask if, no, not his name is Bao. What triggered it for Bao was when he asked, is jurisdiction an element of the charge? So that, that wasn't, 
you know, that wasn't a trigger. I, I'll agree that with some, maybe they see us as a personal front, you know. I, but I, I, I tend to believe that the overwhelming majority are just narcissists who simply do not like being questioned. And when you catch them lying, they don't like it. And so that's when they tend to get a, a bit upset. So, and I guess that that comes back to the whole like how you're directing yourself in the room, right? Are are you aiming that question and wording that question in such a way that it sounds like you're talking to the judge, or, or are you directing it at the prosecution? And we obviously already covered that, but I think that keeps the line from them not feeling like they're being questioned. You're allowed to question the other side. The two parties question each other all the time, and the judge remains neutral. It, uh, his problem comes when you aim the questions at him, and he and he views them in some way that it's like. Uh, like I described. Yeah, but you, but, you, but and for my, you know, if you have to go through this, I hope you don't have to. But we know that we get a, and this has only happened one time in twenty years, and it happened in Alberta of all places. It's so in all these thousands of times, every time we ask the police officer on the stand when he's on the stand, if there is evidence to support his own conclusion, he just gave. Any evidence to prove that just because you're physically in Canada, the Constitution laws apply, the judges typically will impeach the witness for you. And, and there's something that came out today i got to mention. This happened in Ireland. And so if you go back in the, in the, 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 the uh, at MarkStevens.net, the success pages, my friend Keith, uh, he just went through this a, few, you know, a couple of weeks ago where the judge was, was blatantly helping the plaintiff. And this is a non-government attack. It's a, it's a, a debt collection. And the prosecution, well, the plaintiff's attorney said that witness A was their witness to prove jurisdiction. And so they put the witness on the stand over key objection. They do it anyway. They answer a few questions. It's time for him on cross-examination. He asks... One question regarding what evidence do you, <laughs> you know, go into the jurisdictional claims they just made. And the judge said, no, you cannot ask any questions of this witness on jurisdiction. Objection. You just put him on, on the stand to prove jurisdiction. And I can't. So, it, so that's something, Mike, that you have to expect, too. But yeah. it's only yeah, happened generally, one generally time. Unfair play. It, <laughs> It's grossly unfair, but it's only happened the one time, and that was to Jermaine. Jermaine has been the only one that ever reported to me that the, where the witness was allowed to answer the question. They didn't have any evidence, okay? Sure, but it's much easier to get this stuff tossed out when the judge and the prosecutor say the witness is incompetent. So, and again, I, I, I do have to reiterate... Just like what we had happen in, in Channel, Arizona, not too far from the fortified compound. I heard the judge impeach the witness. She was convicted of one of the two charges anyway. So just because they impeach the witness doesn't mean they're going to do the right thing. This gets to what I'm saying about their psychology and what they don't like. I think it's less to do with them us challenging their system, okay, and being an affront to that. I think it's a challenge to them, that's the yes. problem. And question. Yeah, so the, yeah. less we, the more we can, the more we can word it to keep it away from them feeling like or, or receiving it that way, right? Then it puts us in a better chance to get what we're well, after. Yeah. Okay. But I, I can, gotta I tell you, I, I don't know how other, how else we can phrase it so that they won't take it in such a way. If if somebody has a better way to phrase the question, uh, yeah, I'm all ears. So we, if I can interrupt for a second, like I can see the uh, judge. <clears throat> saying that um, um, impeaching the, uh, the the police officer on the on the grounds of or of jurisdiction, but allowing him to still proceed with um, his evidence regarding the 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 charge at hand, like the actual um, the actual offense. Um, I could totally see the judge saying, "Well, he's not qualified to answer that question, so he doesn't have to answer that question, but he can um, be qualified to answer questions of what he observed, as well as the incident at hand, kind of thing." Like, how would yeah. you uh, re rebut that? Well, that one's easy. Because the police officer is the one who is why he made determinations of probable cause and he gave you the ticket. Didn't it say on the ticket that started all this? Doesn't it say that you violated the law? Yes. Isn't that a legal conclusion or is that a statement of fact? Which one he's, is it? He's alleging. He's alleging that you did. He's alleging, Not but what, what's the yeah. nature of the allegation? Is the allegation one of, is it in the nature of a legal conclusion, or is it a statement of fact? I think it's a statement of fact. He witnessed you do a thing. 
He witnessed you violate the law is a statement of fact? Uh, he witnessed you violate uh, something that is described. Yeah, so they describe, you know, you can't do X, Y, or Z. He witnesses you do X, Y, or Z. So he's making so, a determination that X, Y, Z applies to you and you violated it. And you think that's... Uh, no, a- that doesn't happen until you've been convicted. He's alleging. So yes. you're, that's why you're allowed to question what you're questioning and it can work, right? Because it hasn't been proven yet. That's true, but he is making a legal determination you violated the law. I just don't know that they categorize it that way. They, they don't I, like I don't, to? I, uh, I get, you know, maybe you're right. They yeah, don't like right. to. Are you, all right, so let's look at this. Is the determination of probable cause a statement of fact only, or is it a legal conclusion? It would be a legal conclusion. I think legal conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so I think you're right. It's a legal conclusion. Now, it's not a judicial determination. It's still a legal conclusion. The police officer is making a determination. The laws apply to you. I have jurisdiction, and I saw you do X, Y, Z, and I believe you violated that code. That's my probable cause to arrest you. Those are legal conclusions. When, yeah. when a police officer makes a determination, he has reasonable, articulable suspicion or probable cause. These are not statements of fact. These are legal conclusions or legal opinions. They're legal allegations, if you will. And so, okay, Mark. So, so let's go back to the tra- let's go back. Let's, let's stay close to where we were then and kind of uh, draw this out to see if the facts would support it. So, did he have re- a, a, like a, a license plate on his car and was he carrying a driver's license? Were those elements involved when the officers making this determination, this legal determination of whether or not these rules apply to you? Yes. However, but, but, but the thing is that we're getting to is we're talking specifically about the officer's qualifications to testify against you. Okay. So if so I, I, I get what you're getting, you know, I understand what you're getting at, but let's take one issue at a time and, and, and wow, holy crap. Uh, the issue being, if, if, if we're just discussing simply the issue of whether the police officer is qualified to testify against you or not, he is absolutely making legal conclusions against you, and he should, and if he's not qualified to have done that, then they have to strike it. Now, what you're getting to is the, whether the evidentiary basis to support his conclusion. If, uh, in yeah, fact, he's yeah, qualified yeah. to make that conclusion in the first place. So I understand what you're getting so you're at. You're chopping off the head. You're chopping well, off the head before the, the body can testify. But I think that they do, Mark. Mark, they'll say that he is qualified to make that determination because let's say he has an appointment under the Traffic and Safety Act. But that's that's the rub. When we actually start asking him, well, you can ask him. This is the way it goes, Mike. It happened in every single case, thousands of times, except for Jermaine's. You ask him on cross examination. <laughs> Did you determine on your own that just because I was physically in Canada, the laws applied and you had jurisdiction to stop me? And he'll say yes. Now, he's affirming his legal determination he made at the stop. When you ask him, what evidence, if any, did you rely on to prove that just because I'm in Canada, your laws apply to me? That's when they'll turn around and they will contradict themselves and say he's not qualified. So, a little more context. Mm -hmm. Before they put okay, the witness that, on the stand, we will object that they are not qualified and don't have personal knowledge of the, because we've done all this in disclosure. They will fight you and say he is qualified. I, I'll give you that. Yes, absolutely. Before he gets on the stand, he is qualified. The moment you ask that question for the evidence proving or the evidence supporting his claim, they will impeach their own witness for for you. They will actually do that for you. And that's why I mentioned before, even though they do that almost every time. It doesn't mean they're going to throw his testimony out and do the right thing. But when they do that, Mike, it's evidence that you're in a rigged game. Because even the witness, they can't make up their mind whether he was test- He, I wrote back as far as 2003 that this was a contradiction of the judge that we could bring into the appellate court if we had to. So if the only thing you brought before the appellate panel was one question, being which determination of the judge was correct? Was he competent? Was he incompetent? Which one? Because if he was competent, they denied effective cross-examination. That's a constitutional error of the first magnitude, and no amount of showing a prejudice would cure it. Mm-hmm. But if he really was incompetent, <clears throat> the judge was required to strike his testimony. And he didn't. So it, it, this is not a new issue. It's just it's, it's, it, 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 it blew my mind that Jermaine, after all these years, didn't get the impeachment of the witness 
from the judge that we that we typically get. But I, I just I noticed the time, so we, we're going to have to... Sorry for nothing. I just noticed the time, so we're going to have to... I noticed the time, and I, I want to make sure I get to some other callers. So, okay, uh, one last question. I, how do I get a hold of Adam to talk to him about this? Get into the No Stay Project Skype chat. If you Skype me at Frank Rizzo 3 I can put you in. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Stay in thank touch with us. Time. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Stay in touch with us and let us, you know, let us know, uh, you know, what, sure. you know, what's going on. So, uh, do appreciate <laughs> it. And, 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 well, I do. I appreciate the call from, from Mike in Alberta and hopefully he gets with us on the chat. So, uh, Hey, and uh, Hey, appreciate uh, you joining us, Adam. That was a good. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure, Mark. I, I enjoy taking it back and forth. I think there's some some finite distinctions that just change um, when you come to apply this method in Canada, right? I, I like it. I think it's great. Um, I think maybe it stops short of getting remedies necessarily because of the frustration that they get with you guys. And uh, often if the crown just withdraws, um, you be. know, you're left just, you know, you're just left alone, but you haven't been made whole. Well, I think that would be the next step, you know. Well, that's why we, yeah, we have to look at what what kind of bonds and insurance uh, the municipalities do carry in Canada. So that might be an option for us up there. I'm going to ask you uh, if you if uh, I got to let you go. I got to get the next caller, but just so I don't screw up and lose my caller line, I'm, could you drop off? I will drop off, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Adam Adam in Calgary, and I want to get back. Uh, uh, wow, um, I do want to mention that. Uh, Bow is supposed to get released today from the Tarrant County uh, Jail. Uh, don't know any other details other than someone posted in the chat. We have a new chat that is just for people like Bow and Terry in Michigan who are in uh, custody. Uh, j- it's just for that. We still have the main chat and all the other chats to do role playing and whatnot, but this is uh, just to, to, to get updates on that. And now I have not heard back from the Tarrant County Commissioner. Uh, so I might have to call some other ones because I had the uh, Dr. Barry Norman decided to hang up on me the other day. I asked him if he uh, if I can ask him some questions regarding uh, the process, the procedures for doing uh, psychological evaluations with the courts. He said uh, no and just hung up the phone. So I'll have to get my answers another way. And Terry Michigan is supposed to be released on, uh, I think, February 2nd or 3rd, so he's going to be out really soon. So hopefully he's, he's out and we can hear from him. He's doing well. I didn't even know or well, we would have done another habeas corpus because uh, it did help get him out sooner the last time. So I would definitely look into filing some complaints against um, uh, Judge Hardy. And uh, gosh, one of the things I was looking into is definitely getting um, a look. I, I am going to be doing this. I am going to be uh, getting in touch with the county commissioners and, the, and the, some other local officials there. And even with the Bar Association, yes, I'm going to file because I think her mental uh, acuity needs to be here. Her mental ability, I think she's got some problems. If she's got an antisocial uh, personality, she needs to, that needs to be known. So whether the investigation goes anywhere, I want her to be uh, questioned. I want it to be a part of her record that her sanity, her mental uh, capacity has been uh, questioned because of what she did to bow. Uh, so well, let me get to the phones uh, here before we're out of time. Uh, we've got area code 970. You're live on the No State Project. I'm assuming you're calling from Colorado. Sure, I'm Mark. Oh, what, what, what's your name? Uh, my, name's, my name's Kenny, calling from Still, Colorado. And I believe a buddy of mine, John, from the same area, posted my success story last week on your page and gave the uh, final disposition from the court. Oh, I got to get that posted. Order to dismiss the uh, prosecution vacated trial five days before the end of speedy trial. Yeah, I, I have reasons. like, I have like four success stories that I have to get posted. So I do appreciate you calling in Kenny. So, uh, this is traffic. Uh, no. Oh, what was it? No, I've got, uh, this, this order of conduct, cursing in public, obstructing a police officer, resisting arrest, and public fighting. Wow. Were any of these allegations... Well, never mind. 
Wow. And so a few days prior to the ex- expiration of the speed of trial, the prosecution withdrew? Uh, he did withdraw. He vacated trial twice before that and then uh, did his final vacate on it. I believe it was five days before the end of speedy trial. So and how long ago? Dismissed all charges. Wow. That's, well, congratulations. How long, how how many months before, weeks before, was the other time that they continued the, the, the trial? Uh, it was a week before that. Wow. Wow, that's that's fantastic! Congratulations. But did you file the paperwork? Is, did you do the motion to dismiss and the the discovery request? I've done it all. This is thirteen and a half months. This battle's been going. Wow, that's that's way way beyond the speedy trial rule. That's a well, they they couldn't arraign me. They could not provide factual evidence that the constitutional law applied to me. For seven months, they could not do this. Okay, walk us through one of these typical appearances. That's just standard appearance. I go in, I've, I've filed my motions. I have my motion to eliminate, my motion to dismiss, on lack of evidence. Uh, I did challenge jurisdiction. I challenged it openly as well as on my motion. And so, and w- w- real quick, all right, so, it off it. so when you did, you did the discovery request and they didn't respond, you filed a motion in limine. And for those who don't know, I, I, I don't even remember what the Latin phrase means in li- motion in limine. But a motion in limine, uh, in simple, simply, is uh, if, if someone like the prosecutor is, or a defendant is making an argument or wants to raise an argument or wants to raise certain uh, facts, uh, if, if there isn't a proper ground for that, or let's say with us, if the prosecution is trying to make an argument, the laws apply, and they have no evidence of that, the motion in limine would be an order from the judge that does not allow the prosecution to argue that. And if you go back in the archives, it was the success stories, I'll post it here. We, we have had the motion in limine granted before, and then we've had a dismissal. So con- that that's great. So if you're, you, 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 So you've asked for the prosecution's evidence directly in, in at least one arraignment. And what was the prosecutor Absolutely. and judge's, what was the prosecutor well as, and judge's response? Well my brain, brain request, the yeah. whole nine. Right. So, so what responses did you get from the prosecution? So I want to know what the prosecutor, how they responded to that. And I want to know how the judge responded. Nonsensical argument. I said, I did not make an argument, Your Honor. I merely asked a question, and no country in this entire planet is asking a question considered an argument. Nice. I merely asked for the, the factual evidence that the Constitution law applied to me. And, of course, the, the judge goes, well, I find that there is factual evidence in here. So then I had to hit him with McNutt, the uh, GMAC, you know, Doctrine of Law found in Leslie B. Levy. And he provided to go, well, we have the... We have the warrantless affidavit for arrest here and the ticket issued by the officer. So then I had to hit him with U.S. v. Bailey. And it's then he decided to go on with it from there. And then. Whoa, 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 wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I, 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 I think you did pretty good. Okay, I think there was something else. And I know I'm Monday morning quarterback in here. But I think you got to. One of the other things you could have done to make it even more effective. Before you pull out those two court cases, and for those who don't know, U.S. versus Bailey, Bailey says the complaint is not evidence. But when he says, I find that there is evidence, a better thing to have done initially would have been to objection. What specifically on the ticket leads you to believe that, that it's evidence proving your Constitution applies to me? I did that exactly, oh. and the judge reversed his, his initial claim and said that he does recognize the Ninth Circuit as a supreme ruling and, and does agree that the evidence is, is or the ticket is not evidence of anything. Great. Okay, so what so happened he, he in that? that right there. So then I again asked for what factual evidence the prosecution has presented to the court that proves the Constitution law applies to me. And that's when I he said that he does find that there is that the court does have jurisdiction. And I said, well based on what evidence? And he said he did not need evidence. And that's when I came out with McNutt v. GMAC. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, it, was, it was a well-handled process. Uh, gosh, yeah, we went through a, a ton of this. I do have something I, I'd like to say. I, was, I just want to touch on something you were saying last week. And I, hate to, just, I don't want to get off topic here. It's just, it is on topic. 
Did you had a complaint in one of the chat rooms, I believe. I've never been in one of your chat rooms. I've never done the, the role playing, the Skype, none of it. I've just realized I've just nose to the grind studying my butt off. So I was, somebody was chastising you for not spending enough time in the chat room or coaching people through enough. Is that what I understood last week? Yeah. Yeah. It was on Saturday. Yeah, the Saturday if, show. If you don't, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to take a time. I've never been in one of those chat rooms. I've never have. But I've seen every single one of your videos, some of them three, four, five, ten times each. Every single one. If you don't know USD Bailey, you don't know Brooke Carpey Janice, you don't know Ashcroft the Eight Falls, you don't know Rule 602, you don't know Rule 3.1, you don't know Rule 401. If you don't know what an interlocutory appeal is, then you haven't done your homework. You've provided every single tool and resource that is needed to adequately defend yourself with these thugs. And I'd like everybody in the Skype and chat rooms to understand that. Instead of pointing the finger and blaming somebody who's trying to help you, get off your butt. Do your homework. Open up the books. Get out there. Do some research. Look these cases up. Understand exactly what you're going into. Know what a reverse onus is. Know when the prosecution tries to flip it on you. I mean, these, these are things that you've got to educate yourself on if you're planning on going in and fighting these, these criminals because they will lock you up. Hey, they don't I, care. If your ducks are not in a row, they will put you down. I appreciate and I think that. you've done more than an adequate enough job to educate the masses. Yeah, I think what people miss is that the idea is not to get dependent on me to do everything. I mean, I've had people offer me a lot of money, and again, I, I could really, really use it. Uh, and I don't take it because I don't want people to just say, here, Mark, you do it. The idea is to get people like what we have in the chat is to where they go through it and then they come back and they help other people. And so they're independent. They don't have to rely on me. And, and you're right. I tell people all the information to effectively defend yourself is on the website. So even when I get these critics, even some that call themselves anarchists, that are outraged that I charge a nom a small fee, um, it's all available on the website for free. Uh, so I do appreciate what you're saying. You, all the information is on the website, the videos, and, and yeah, it's from what you just said. Yeah, you, you've, you've proven, at least to me, I know the videos pretty intimately. You've, you've, you've watched more than a few videos. <laughs> Gee, you, you know what you, you – and, 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 and you were able to go in there and, and effectively defend against this. It would have been great to get it without prejudice. But I think the fact that you went in – you didn't necessarily do the role playing with us, but you did learn. You watched the videos. You did some role playing with your with uh, with uh, with John, though, right? Uh, not until recently. John came over directly after he had lost his last his most recent case, and I was getting ready to go in. They postponed my trial in order to take care of his. Okay. They said that they had double booked trials and postponed mine, and. When I I have all my recordings, obviously I have good you know discreet recordings from every single session with the district attorney, every uh, hearing in court. I have it all discreetly recorded, all audio. Nice. But uh, it's very clear on there that they did mention John's name directly, and that they had chosen to take his trial over mine, and that was the first extension on it. So let me ask you. But it was really, really, go ahead. Did you get? a response from the prosecutor in writing to the motion to dismiss and the Brady request. Yes, I did. And that's where you're, you're getting the nonsensical where they said nonsensical. Yes, absolutely. As well as, as well as this, uh, this comical, uh, motion in limine they filed prior to the, uh, trial proceedings. They filed one against you. Absolutely. Nice. What did it say? What were they trying to restrict it, you? It's, it's, it, it's very comical. Because uh, obviously I brought up the, the challenge of jurisdiction on several occasions, just demanding the factual evidence. In the very first paragraph in their motion in limine, his, it says, oh, because they forced myself into a pro se, the, the judge, even though over my objections and my motion that the judge does not represent me and is not my counsel. They still pushed it on me to a uh, judge entered a not guilty plea on my behalf and then forced me into pro se. 
And were you trying to, did you use the plea of not guilty? Yes, I was. See, again, lying, yeah, they said it, they lying said it up so, son of a... So much. They said the defendant is representing himself pro se. Therefore, the people request that the defendant be limited from engaging and or mentioning certain facts not in evidence. Such well, as? Wait a minute. You, you definitely, you just implicated yourself. You just admitted to a Brady violation as I've asked for the factual evidence that the Constitution will not apply to me. I also chastised the judge, brought it up to him that you're allowing the prosecution to proceed without facts and evidence that should destroy misconduct and prosecutorial misconduct. The judge kind of shuffed it off. And yeah. Said, so you're allowing well, the prosecution to proceed without facts and evidence over my objections. Wait, wait all right. What yeah. specifically? Now, he's saying he wanted you yeah. not to be able to make arguments that, that weren't supported by facts and evidence, which was exactly the same thing that you were requesting. But you had specific arguments he was not permitted to make. What specific arguments was he claiming you couldn't make? Uh, argument statements of being a sovereign citizen. Uh, he did not want me to argue the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act or the UCMJ oh. for your active uh, duty United States military personnel. <laughs> because that what the, what the a, hell did that have to do with your defense? Well, what did that have I, to do with your defense? Up. Oh. I brought it up in a meeting with a no, in a meeting with the district attorney, not on the record of the transcript. But why? And the district, the district attorney was telling me that no matter what, simply because I am physically in Colorado, that the Constitution will apply to me. And it was one of my, uh, you know, smart-ass rhetorical comments saying, "Does that also apply to active duty military personnel?" And he told me to leave his office. Are you active military just, personnel? No, I'm not. But I also understand that they do not have jurisdiction over active duty military personnel. They recognize this. Okay, uh, so not something I, I would have. I can uh, now. I understand why he brought it up. That that that's pretty clear. But it's interesting. The irony to is. Oh, uh, uh, here's here's what you're looking for. The defense previously filed a motion to dismiss in this matter, alleging dated March 23rd, 2017. Among other nonsensical claims, a lack of jurisdiction. This honorable court denied that motion via an oral and written order, respectively, in March and June of this year. As those are the both the two times that I have filed the paperwork to say that you have not met your obligation of facts and evidence. You have not met your prima facie. But yes, among other nonsensical claims, a lack of jurisdiction. <laughs> What a, what is can you give me the name of the sovereign uh, citizen thing which I had never made a claim to whatsoever okay that's a fail that now that that is that is pretty that that's some dirty pool there so can you give me the judge's name and the prosecutor's name uh the judge is mr Metzger it is Paul H Metzger and that is out of Garfield County Colorado and the prosecutor's the name attorney's name the, uh, I was dealing with the deputy prosecutor, you know, obviously. Sure. The elected prosecutor is Jefferson J. Cheney, C-H-E-N-E-Y. And the deputy district attorney is Anthony Hershey, H-E-R-S-H-E-Y. Hershey. Ah, well, I have to look them up. I would suggest filing a claim for damages against their in, uh, against the uh, county's insurance. And which county was this? Garfield. Garfield County. Garfield. Yeah, I found out that there's not well, only a uh, there's a Garfield County in Colorado. There's one in Utah, and I found out today or yesterday rather, doing some editing, that there's one in Washington also. So I guess that's kind of a common yeah. one. Well, this is that, Garfield County, Colorado. God, that is Furthermore, fantastic. This is this is what's really disturbing. I mean, I, I've, I've heard some of your broadcasts talking about special messages, secret codes that are written from arresting officers to the judge, such as ones on the complaint. Yes, the they, they, yes. Yeah, there are news reports that I've played on the show where police officers write notes to the judge. The very last sentence in my warrantless affidavit for arrest, which is notarized, Grant Burris is the notary republic for notary public for the state of Colorado, and I've got his notary, notary ID here because it's stamped on my warrantless affidavit. The very last sentence on this before he signs it, and note that this is under oath. It states very clearly that it's under oath at the very beginning. 
It says, I ran Mr. Strait myself through CCIC, which is Colorado Crime Information Center. He had no warrants or restrictions other than being a sexual offender. I've never been charged, accused, tried, convicted of any such heinous crime ever in my entire life. Ever. There's nowhere on my record, never has been, never will be. Garfield, that is just an atrocious claim. Garfield County risk management is where you start, my friend. File a claim for damages, and I'd file also uh, complaints against all the actors involved with the county commissioners and the bar association, and uh, uh, for the hell of it with the judicial conduct commission. But the judge can still get a you know nothing's going to happen to him, but I'd still, you know, cause you can copy and paste a lot of it and put, put that in there. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't take it lying down. It's great that you won. It's fantastic. You, you, you're, you, you know, you, you have a lot more credibility now that it's been tossed out, which is great. Uh, the insurance company may, may actually take this seriously. Just don't make it for 25 million, make it reasonable, make it, you know, to cover your time expenses yeah. and a little bit of punitive, if you can, uh, you know, get it, which would be well, great. We've seen that, yeah. And that's on public record now. That's a public notary. This is a public document. It was entered in a uh, public court. This is now public record. Anybody looks this up is going to look up and see that my name and all of a sudden now I'm a sex offender for no, I've never been. You, you got anything to, remotely even close to this? Yeah, you got to get that expunged. That's that. that yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm a, I'm a little over time, yeah, I mean, but hey, uh, it's, it's you know defamation in the highest degree. Well, sure, uh, absolutely, definitely, uh, yeah. And you can make that part of your claim against the county if they don't do that. So you know you can let them know. I already have a complaint against the county. If you don't remove this, I'm going to you know I'll amend my complaint against the insurance to include what you're doing. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. So they might just, you know, expunge it right then and there. But, hey, if they don't, definitely put that damage, uh, you know, calculate some damage uh, for that. Because that, 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 that's, that's pretty bad. Yeah, that could keep you from getting a job. So Absolutely. That, uh, and before, I know you're running short on time, Mark, and I hate to bother you, bother you up. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and look up some stuff. There was a big debate during the election cycle last year when the district attorneys were running for office. One was a Democrat, one was a Republican. Obviously, they didn't get along. The elected sheriff, Lou Valerio, in Garfield County was having an argument via email with the then-elected district attorney, Sherry Kaloya, and he stated it was on the front page of the Post Independent for Glenwood Springs, Colorado. The sheriff stated openly in one of his emails to her, you don't know what you're doing. You're forcing my officers to make unwarranted arrests and then try to prove it in court. I'm sick of this behavior. Those are that's direct verbatim, direct from the sheriff's mouth. You're forcing my officers to make unwarranted arrests and then try to prove it in court. Wow. Well, the the sheriff could always have made an arrest for obstruction and you know conspiracy. So they really want you know that's the thing when it comes down to it. Someone like a sheriff or a judge, if you really want to stop the behavior, you can. At least you can make a big, you know, you can make a big uh, splash about it. Sounds good. Hey, I appreciate the call, and congratulations. Hey, Mark, thanks for your time. I look forward to hearing from you again. And uh, keep putting out the videos, man. You're doing a hell of a great job. Will do. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Kenny in Colorado, mm-hmm. appreciate the call and, and the, the kind words. And before I go, what I want to, I want to, and I'll talk more about this. Uh, I think it's very, this is something that hit me the other day. We, I think it's very important that we contact the local, you know, the authorities there in Tarrant County or also there in, in Michigan about this Dick Noble, uh, especially th- th- what's, you know, because what's happening with Bow. We should be filing uh, our own complaints regarding what happened to Bow, questioning Cheryl Hardy's mental capacity. Let her defend putting a man in jail for a psych evaluation, for asking a question. Asking a question! So this is where it would be helpful to have some psychologists or psychiatrists that we can know and say, look, we need to get this. We need to have psychologists actually stating the obvious, that questioning whether jurisdiction is an element of the crime or just questioning if the prosecution has evidence to support a legal conclusion, that is no grounds for a psychological evaluation. This woman is a vindictive monster. 
She did this to punish him, not because she thought that his psychological, he, he, you know, uh, uh, health was, uh, was was questionable. This is an educated woman with a doctorate degree. She doesn't like to be challenged. So we need, and I know I'm going to do this. I'm not going to just get in touch with the county commissioners to talk about how the the psycho valves are, are done. Damn it, I want to know what this Barry Norman, I want to know what the hell he is told when he before he does an evaluation. They don't go into it blind. Just do a psyche eval on this guy. No, they have, they, there's some information that's given. It has to be. And I want to get complaints in about her mental capacity. Not that she's crazy, but that she's an antisocial, narcissistic monster. This woman's mental capacity should be questioned and should be at issue. And we need to get that in there. I know I'm going to do the best I can to get something in writing down to the county commissioners. And I have to look up what other agencies I can, I can file that with. Be, you know, there's, there's more that we can do than we should be doing. Anytime these monsters want to even threaten that, their mental capacity has got to be questioned. So I'm glad that Bow is getting out today. I hope that, that you know, the information we got uh, is accurate and he's out. Hopefully Terry's out real soon. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we had the most views during a live broadcast ever today. So I do. I don't want to give the number out because it's still too depressing. But we are over 10,000 subs. So, I do, you know, hey, that, that's great. So let's work on the, the next 10,000. It's been episode 49 of the commercial-free edition of the No State Project here uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, for January 31st, 2018, I will be live on Saturday's broadcast for the LRN broadcast. Not going to be streamed on YouTube, though, uh, because I will be out of town. But I will be live, so whoever we missed uh, today will get to you on Saturday. So uh, until the next time... Oh, I don't think we're going to Until next time, salute.